support and also thank you very much for inviting me for this conference. Great talk. And I th thank all the previous speakers who mentioned about Dysel from especially Dr. K uh, Kenneth Lehner and uh, uh, Horowitz and uh, uh, Dr. Kim Lewis. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's a great story, an amazing story. I just wanted to share the excitements with you. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, I just uh, changed the title, uh, Breaking Silver Bullet. I really think, uh, because based on our preclinical model studies, what we are doing, and also lots and lots of anecdotal evidence we have, as the, Dr. Kim Lewis mentioned, a lot of patients are literally uh, requesting their clinicians to prescribe that. So there are about five uh, dedicated uh, face group groups, and then they keep posting their experience, including the one which started by Christina Bauer. She's here. So it's, it appears it's very, very promising. So I'm going to just uh, you know, show a few uh, uh, our results and also some of uh, the possible uh, opportunities to why we need to look at Dysel from very carefully. The next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, 20 to, uh, uh, 10 to 20 percent of the patients, they always end up with the chronic symptoms. And uh, you know, after attending this meeting, I removed this post-treatment Lyme disease now, nomenclature because I don't know how people are going to accept it. And uh, so what I thought is, you know, to look at this issue, pain is real and the treatment is possible. You know, all my previous uh, speakers also mentioned treatment is possible. So that's a positive note. And, uh, you know, I just always take an inspiration from art. This one is the Michelangelo. You can see uh, that David is holding a bubble to attack a Goliath, a huge giant. Of course, the problem is very, very complicated. Perhaps the result, I mean, the possibility and also the opportunity is very, very simple. Uh, I, I know that's the reason why we started looking at uh, Dysel from very carefully about four years ago, and much more carefully after Kim Louis started looking at it, because we thought something you know, very interesting. That's why a very serious scientist like Kim Louis is also focusing on it. The next slide. So these are all the, uh, you know, my people. It, we are about a 16 members team. And uh, uh, six of them are totally dedicated for uh, Lyme disease research. And uh, Ying Zhang, I wanted to thank, because uh, even though we started at 2011, our first high throughput screening, uh, he published it first. Before that, the major uh, screen. And then, of course, the Kenneth Lehner, our clinician, uh, he's very, very different from other clinicians, extremely scientifically motivated clinician. Once he saw his patients started uh, expressing a lot of positive effects of Dysel from, he started calling me almost weekly once. And he, with all excitements, one hour he will, ex you know, one by one, in every minute detail, he will share it with me. I used to take notes and discuss with my team. And so that helped me to a lot of designing uh, in a lot of preclinical model. So then uh, Monica Embers, my collaborator, who is having a very good uh, chronic model. So she is right now, currently as we speak, doing a big uh, preclinical model studies with the Dysel from formulation we developed. And uh, Dr. Mark Davis, who is kind of, uh, is basically chair of Lyme Working Group at Stanford. So I wanted to uh, also uh, thank Bay Area Lyme Foundation by providing the support, and uh, uh, you know, Live Lime Foundation, LK Whittier Foundation, Laurel Stem Foundation. All these foundations, they gave us a moderate support and also a time-bound support. I didn't get a prolonged, you know, open-ended support any of these foundations. The reason for that uh, is because, uh, because when, you know, they, the foundations always choose kind of very popular researchers. Unfortunately, I'm not a very popular researcher in this area, so I retracted a minimum support. But I'm still very grateful to them. And uh, in many, if you see Jonathan Locke, Christine Bohr, Beverly Murphy, she's also here, Jose and Harrison. These people, they are kind of patient support group, and they 
send a lot of support for us, a lot of donation for us, unrestricted grants. So we are kind of surviving through this money. And uh, I just uh, take uh, my inspiration from uh, uh, Dr. Sir John Robert Wayne. Jo Robert Wayne tried to develop aspirin as a therapeutic molecule. But you know, when people, you know, scientists wanted to develop a, such a such a simple molecule as a therapy, everybody warned him. He's not going anywhere. So ultimately, it led to a shutting down his lab because he couldn't attract any funding. Aspirin, you know, it was known almost 4,000 years. Below bark, people used to take and then treat patients. People know about it. So they thought, they ridiculed him. They thought, why you are going to make a big therapy out of it? But still, he believed that aspirin, by understanding aspirin, how exactly it works, and understanding how the chronic condition it is reversing, it can lead to a lot of, lot of therapeutic opportunity. So I thought, disulfiram may be in another aspirin. Perhaps at one point it will be, you know, declared as a molecular of the year. So this is uh, my, so first of all, we wanted to find out whether, whether we have any animal model that we show the pain, whatever the pain people are facing. So Borrelia, especially when we are, uh, you know, exposing the animals, with the, especially the animal model we have, they are tend to develop the disease, not the like uh, wild type mice. You see, they never d develop any disease, and these models they develop disease. So once you g inject the Borrelia to them in 28 days, you see a profound, very significant increase, a signature of inflammatory markers in their blood and also in in the gene expression. So it's very very real. Like it's not that these animals. And of course, if you leave these animals untreated, they do develop arthritis, they do develop other kind of complication. And uh, so we, do, you know, unfortunately, sorry for this slide, I put it in the la last minute. So then we thought, why not we look at, why only the immune uh, cytokines level, why not we look at the brain? Because most of the people, they always say they have a huge brain, pro uh, uh, you know, fatigue and other kind of problems. So maybe we need to look at the cognition level very, very carefully. First, we started very simple. We just, uh, like as Kenneth Lehner, uh, you know, mentioned in the previous uh, uh, meeting, so we just took it in a very a simpler approach. Like we took a small portion of the Borrelia, a triacylated lipid. We ensured, you know, we wanted to put them in the brain and we wanted to find out whether these animals have a cognition problem. The answer is yes. Borrelia, even after its death, like for example, it can shell out a lot of lipid particles. These lipid particles can cross blood-brain barrier and cause disease. I mean, if these particles, they survive for very, very long time in the brain, and other part of the peripheral area, they are going to cause a disease and sustain the disease. So this paper uh, got published in early this uh, uh, you know, uh, year, and uh, you know, it got into uh, General of Neuroscience cover page. These two individuals out of the six, they played very, very important role because they believed therapy is possible. The first one is Ravindra Potanini. He started like seven years ago, the high throughput screening, which, uh, you know, um, he listed the top 20 molecules he wanted to be in developing in the, you know, another four or five years. We are, and, uh, and he did. And the next one is Harikara Potula. He is basically immunologist, and also he is interested in you know, studying the effect of Borrelial infection on cognition problem and how disulfiram is curing uh, this problem. So this is the, uh, you know, what are the reports we have at Stanford University. We are extremely fortunate. We have this you know, uh, great collection of molecule. It's all printed in these uh, you know, slides we get. And in this, uh, we culture the bacteria and then try to see how much bacteria survive in the presence of these compounds. So we have this uh, uh, opportunity, and we use that opportunity for the development. So now, you know, because of lack of time, I just uh, go to the, the, this slide, the famous slide which Dr. Kim Lewis kindly, you know, uh, supported this in one of his talk. The top one is disulfiram, uh, you know, the top one. And I also put disulfiram in another slide which you see, it's dangerous in a sense, uh, 
uh, it's not because of its exceptional toxicity. Uh, it's not like something. So when I started working on it, I went and met the person who is an expert in aldehyde dehydrogenases. She got a company, and she very carefully looked at this problem. So she told me disulfiram is not a bad drug. It's not a very toxic drug. 40 years, you know. And a lot of people are on disulfiram for a very long time. You know, if it's a bad drug, they would have pulled it out of the market. It's not a bad drug. Then why people are so scared about disulfiram? The reason for that, our civilization is literally so much knowingly or unknowingly addicted to alcohol. Because this drug, it's almost like, you know, if you see the life of uh, Samson and Delilah, you, uh, when before uh, Samson was promised, his parents was asked, told no alcohol, not even related anything to alcohol. If you take a disulfiram, from even 100 milligrams, you go to a, a you know like a hospital. You just, there is a you know sanitizer. You just use the sanitizer. That's all. You need an hospitalization for that, because you get a, such a horrible, horrible side effects. So that is the only problem. I am from originally India. I you know, for us this is not a big problem because not not many of us we are used to have a lot of alcoholic products. But for uh, European and US-based uh, patients, this is going to be a huge problem. Uh, that's uh, one big issue we face. So no alcohol. And then, they, but still it is worth, as Ken mentioned, it still is worth. Why? It is having so many uh, nice, good things. And uh, uh, we, we really think we found out exactly where disulfiram acting uh, in based on our biophysical in silico calculations and also our, we just uh, started getting the results. We found out few outer coat proteins binds very, very effectively to disulfiram and then act as a delivery agent to kill the bacteria itself. That's a very interesting. Maybe in an another conference I will talk about the details. We just uh, getting the data. So disulfiram. Uh, so this particular enzyme, if you see how exactly it uh, degrades, it gets into one particular molecule called DDC. That's a major uh, molecule, which is having a lot of therapeutic value as far as the bacterial killing. So, but unfortunately, it also develops into a lot of other products. That's why I gave a title, it's kind of uh, degrading molecule. And uh, what we found out in our lab, my lab is a biomaterial advanced drug delivery lab. So when we realized that IP injection is not effectively sterilizing the mice, I developed their oral injections. I, I tried to, sorry, oral uh, delivery system. I developed their lipids and also carbohydrate mixes. I screened thousands of them. Finally, we found out a very effective you know, combination that can deliver the disulfiram in the upper part of the lower intestine, and then we got a perfect and maximum sterilization. So that's the good news, and there's a company licensed this product from Stanford University, and it's called Flight Path Biosciences. They are developing it, and uh, I am so glad that uh, you know uh, uh, clinicians are taking this very seriously, and I'm thankful for this. So pain is real. And there is an opportunity to address the pain. Thank you.